Well, good morning. Y'all are good looking this morning. Both looking good. I don't know what y'all's problem is. I'd like to be as close to y'all as I can. Let's see, a couple things I want to mention. I want to add my thanks to the people who came out and helped. And we have people who do things all week long. And, you know, every little thing, nothing's little in the kingdom of God. Um, uh, I want to give an example. Miss Sandy came in. And Miss Ann does a fantastic job on these great, these big square beds have been hers and different people help her but she keeps those absolutely beautiful but the little bitty pots up front she and I both we just couldn't ever we'd put something there and it'd die and we'd put something else and it'd die and she'd say well you want to try this and it looked terrible and we did all of these things and Miss Sandy came in and she's kind of taken that on among other things and it is such a blessing when somebody's like well I know what to do with that so that's how when we all share our gifts, what a blessing it can be. And it's really rewarding to get to use your gifts. Uh, something I'm excited about on Easter Sunday is that the young people have a skit, and it's going to be good. It's going to be next level. So I'm excited about that. I want to encourage you, if you've never been water baptized, this is your time. Be water baptized. If you've been water baptized before, you've been far from God and you're like coming back to him, you can get water baptized again. Um, and sometimes people get water baptized not because, you know, they, they've been far from him, but because um, they, they say, you know, I was baptized really young and I didn't understand what it meant and I get it now and I want to do it again. Um, and even, I know last year, Silas was like, I was young when I was water baptized, and I want to do it as, as a, an adult. That's hard to say. As an adult. <laughs> and he got water baptized last year. So uh, it's a special thing. Um, it's an outward sign of what's going on on the inside. Jesus was water baptized. I think that's a good reason to be water baptized. All right, and uh, one last thing I want to mention is please keep my dad's family up, uh, lifted up in your prayers. My parents are out of town this weekend visiting my brother. My brother lives in Manteo, North Carolina at the coast, and they had a couple of big events that were going on with grandkids that they were going to be able to, to be a part of more than one thing this weekend, so they're there. Um, but my Uncle Randy, who is, doesn't make a lot of appearances at church, but um, he has been very faithful to keep our yard up for years. He is having a lot of physical trouble, and their sister, Mary Ann, just passed away. So it's kind of like a double whammy, you know? Uh, so it's kind of a hard time. Their, their, their sister, my Aunt Mary Ann, she is just one of the most loving, the most generous woman with her love. And she's going to be so greatly missed. And I know that my dad and Randy are really grieving for her. And then he's having some pretty serious physical trouble. So please keep them lifted up in your prayers. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you that we're here this morning. Thank you that you're here this morning. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. I thank you that Jesus brought us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And I thank you that this morning we receive more light for living. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been talking about, for the first few little slides here, I'm going to give numbers. This means nothing to anybody but who's back there. Do I see James? All right, so number one, the purpose of Christ. The purpose of Christ. We've been learning that the purpose of Christ is redemption. Today is part three. Number two. Today is part three. We are going to begin talking about the realities of our redemption. What does it mean in real life, in real time, to be redeemed? Okay, okay. Today, we're going to talk about redeemed from spiritual death. 
And when we come back after Easter, we will, we're going to talk about some other realities, but this is the first one we're going to get to. Um, but I have a couple of questions for you. My first question is, how does the Easter bunny keep his fur looking so good? Nobody knows? Hairspray. Oh, thank you. I love people who laugh out loud. All right, I'm going to laugh out louder. All right, what is the, this is an easy one, okay? I want everybody to get a good grade. What's the Easter Bunny's favorite restaurant? I hop. Okay, e Easter can be a difficult time, especially if you entertain, have your family, have big meals and do all that. What is the best way to make Easter easier? Anyone? How do we make Easter easier? Put an I where the T is. Did y'all need a slide for that? Okay. How does Easter end? How does Easter end? With an R. With an R. Easter ends with an R. I think y'all needed visuals this morning. Okay. What's the most important thing you can do for Easter? Come to church and bring somebody with you. Come to church and bring somebody with you. We've been talking about why did Jesus come to the world? Why? As Christians, we need to be really know this answer. His purpose is connected to my purpose. His purpose, his purpose, the purpose of Christ is connected to why I made a decision to follow Christ, why you made a decision to follow Christ. So we need to, we need to be experts at this, okay? So number three, the purpose of Christ, we read this, 1 John 3, 8 said, he who sins is of the devil. So we want to put sin far away from us, right? He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning and ever since. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see some other places in, in the Gospels and in the Scriptures where Jesus talks about his purpose. And all of his, and it, it might be worded a little differently, but it's the same thing. So as you see that, watch that, and think about how all of those purposes line up to be, mean exactly the same thing, no matter how he words it, okay? So uh, sin is the work of the devil. That's the devil's work. And sin separates us from God. So uh, sin, the Bible, the Bible talks about, gives us lists of what things are sin, and then it goes so far as to say anything not of faith is sin. Anything not of faith is sin. So faith says, I'm doing this God's way. That's what faith says. I'm going to do it God's way. So anything not of faith is sin. So we talked about four aspects of what the word redemption means. The first thing that Jesus came and did, this is number four, is he located us. He found us in a, when I say us, I mean all of humanity, men, women, boys, and girls. He found us in a state of bondage, under Satan's power, no longer sons of God. So go back and listen to that again. You know, I told you, you've got to give space for the Holy Spirit to give you revelation. Revelation is when God takes us out of darkness and into light. And that happens as we apply ourselves to the Word of God, and we give the Holy Spirit space. So go, I listen to messages over, and I don't listen to myself, but I listen to messages over and over and over again. I study them over and over and over again because I want the Holy Spirit to give me revelation. Revelation is when he turns the lights on. The lights come on, and it's like, now I can see. 
Okay, so he located us, and then after he located us, he permanently removed us from Satan's power. We studied that out through the scriptures. He paid the ransom price. There was a cost that needed to be paid, and what was that ransom? What was the ransom price that Jesus paid? His own blood. His own blood. And then he restored us to a position of sons of God. He, ha he restored us. So mankind was, was born onto this earth. Uh, the purpose and intention of God is that we would be sons of God. But when sin entered the world and death entered the world, we lost that position. But Jesus paid the price and bought us back. So we learned that Satan has no legal right to control us, our bodies, our families, our businesses, our money. There is not an area of your life that Satan has a right to control. I'll give you an example in my own life. Um, in September, uh, Pastor Brad and I went to our regional ministers conference and it was at Myrtle Beach and we had not been to Myrtle Beach in in 10 years 20 years I don't know it's been forever and ever and Myrtle Beach I know people say a lot of bad things about it but it's still a good beach I mean like as far as sand and water it's pretty cool so we were in the ocean and we were having so much fun playing in the water and then I got stung by a jellyfish and it was incredible pain it felt like I had a thousand little needles sticking in it was right here on my leg it felt like I had a thousand little needles like oh that is some serious pain and so I was like oh, Brad I just got stung by a jellyfish I'm gonna have to go go in I want to get out of the water I want to get away from the jellyfish so uh, I started going in and I was like you know oh man this really hurts and we had just read Sunday morning in church and this was probably Monday we had just read the scripture where he has given us authority over all the power of the enemy and that scripture came back to me immediately and then I had a little bit of a struggle okay we've got authority over all the power of the enemy and then I thought you know God created the jellyfish Jellyfish are awesome. They're creation of God. They're not something to be feared or hated. So I had to work through this, you see. And we have to work through things sometimes to walk by faith. So I had to work through this, and then I said, but poison is from the enemy. God didn't give the jellyfish poison for us. That's part of the fall, okay? So then I said, I just started speaking the word of God over over that uh, jellyfish thing and in no time it just quit it just quit hurting immediately immediately and like 20 years before I had been stung by a jellyfish and it swelled up and um, it stayed swollen up for like three months so I mean I've had a really strong reaction to them before and just so you know that the quicker you the quicker you get something the easier it is the quicker you come against it, you know, you, you get it on the front end, it's a whole lot easier. You can take care of sickness or whatever it is at any point, but man, it's a lot easier if you'll just immediately apply the Word of God, just immediately. Okay, so, so Satan has no legal right of any area of our life. We once belonged to him, true, but we no longer do. Okay, so today we're going to talk about we're redeemed from spiritual death. So let's look at Genesis 2. Number 5. Number 5 first. Have we, do we have that? Have we already done that? I'll take this. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God, so this is in the beginning. This is, Genesis means beginning, Okay. At the beginnings and we are with Adam and Eve in the garden and this is just after they have partaken of the fruit okay so this is what happened as a result 
Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, so they haven't partaken yet, okay? He commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Okay, so they were put in this beautiful paradise and all their needs were met. Every need was supplied. He said, you may, every tree in this garden, you may eat. Are we in the same place? You need to be in Genesis chapter 2. There you go. Verse 15. There you go. All right, so then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Okay, so he put a boundary. He says, this is what you can do, and this is what you can't do. You may not eat from this garden. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the first curse God said would come upon man for breaking his law, you shall surely die. Now, if you are familiar with the book of Genesis, you know that they did eat, right? Did they drop dead? No, they did not drop dead. But God said, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What happened? They did not die physically. They died spiritually. There are different kinds of death in the Bible, and we're going to look at that this morning. You know, so many people are afraid of death. But in this area, just like any other area, we can walk by faith. There are so many people that are so fearful of death. Many people that have brought up in church and lived a life in church are afraid of death. But in this area, we can be in faith. You know, I've heard it said that faith begins where the will of God is known. So if you know the will of God, you can, on death, you can be in faith. You don't have to be in fear. You should not be in fear. So what is, this day, they died spiritually. The Bible calls it spiritual death. Let's look at Genesis 3, 22. Genesis 3, 22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. So God says one of us, he's speaking to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's why it's plural there. God is plural in the Hebrew in, in the book of Genesis. He has become, man's become like one of us to know good and evil. So, so God knows the difference in good and evil. But you know that the Bible says that God is not tempted by evil, and God doesn't tempt with evil. So God is not a tempter. He's not a one tempting you, okay? So he said, he has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim, that's an angel, angels. He placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So God said it's really important now that they're in this state of knowing good and evil that they don't partake of the tree of um, of eternal life because what would happen is it, man would be forever in that state so he he uh on that day man became a slave of sin and death that's the day okay so can you see that death is not a part of god's creation not a part of god's original plan it was not god's will who willed that into being and adam actually right? At the prompting of the devil, by following the leading of the devil, Adam willed that 
we're going to do something different than what God said. All right. So this morning we are going to talk about redeemed from spiritual death. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So death is an enemy of God and man, according to Scripture. Death is an enemy. To understand death, we have to understand that man is not a physical being. Okay? Man is a spirit. Man, remember that God is a spirit, and the Bible tells us man was created in the image of God. Man is a spirit who possesses a soul who on this earth lives in a body. When you leave this earth, you shed this body. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 gives us our whole being. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see the makeup of mankind, of men and women, spirit, soul, and body. And by the way, in Christ, there is no male or female. So sometimes I say man. Um, Some of the newer translations will say people. uh, But we are a spirit. The eternal part of us is a spirit. We have a soul. Our soul goes with us. We'll see that in a minute. And we live in a body. All right, we're going to see what Jesus said about some of these things. Let's look at John 3. John 3, we have the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the rulers of the Jews. He was a Pharisee, religious leader, okay? So he comes, uh, the Pharisees were the insiders, and Jesus was an outsider. Jesus didn't come through man's religious way. Jesus was an out. The ultimate insider, the, the God who breathed creation into existence, the ultimate insider was an outsider. That's Jesus, okay? So here we have Nicodemus coming to him. He comes under the cover of night. He really doesn't want to be seen. And it says in John 3, 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. So he speaks on behalf of all the Pharisees. He says, we know you've come from God. How does he know it? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus cut straight to it with, with Nicodemus. He said, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus cut straight to it with Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's like, this this sounds impossible, Jesus. And Jesus said, most assuredly. He's telling a leader of the Jews, Nicodemus, this is important. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's our physical body. That's physical birth. That's water. He's comparing and contrasting here. Water and spirit. That that's born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. He said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. The new birth is one way we describe being born again. It is the rebirth, not of the physical body. It's a rebirth of the human spirit, being born again, the rebirth. So remember that we're looking at, we're looking to get a scriptural understanding of what death is, for one thing. 
Because remember, God said, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Romans 5.12. We've looked at this one before. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So no one exempt. So sin makes us separated from God. Sin makes us separated from God. And Jesus said it, it was death. Death entered the world. Death entered. Well, all of those things we learned about the location of where we were before Jesus, we were in a position of death. But Jesus said, you must be born again. You must experience a new birth. Your human spirit must be born, uh, born again. So I just want to mention this, is that babies are born perfect. Babies are born perfect. If babies die before they, they mature, they make heaven their home, okay? So, so babies are not born, because um, sometimes people, people ask about this, but, uh, but as soon as a child is able to recognize right from wrong and make a choice, then they're accountable for their sin, Okay? So uh, we call that the age of accountability. When do we become accountable? I think it's different for every person. But when you, when you can choose right from wrong and you choose wrong, you've sinned. All right. So let's look at some more insights on this in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is not, the kids are going to be doing a skit on Lazarus, but it's a different Lazarus, okay? So the rich man and Lazarus, verse 19. There was a certain rich man. Now, first of all, when Jesus spoke in parables, the Bible usually tells us, and then he spoke a parable. But when Jesus says a certain rich man, he's talking about a real man. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. The name Lazarus means God my help. Lazarus was full of sores who laid at the rich man's gate, desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So, so it was that the beggar died. And was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in torments, in Hades, another word for hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. All right. So we can learn a lot. We are just going to get the, the surface of this story uh, today, of, of the things that we can learn from this story that Jesus gave. First of all, both Lazarus and the rich man have died, and they're both still conscious. They're still conscious. There is no such thing as soul sleep, okay? They're, they're both still conscious. Now, Lazarus was carried away by the angels, not just one angel. So, uh, it's very common when you are with people that are dying, they start to see angels. Um, when my grandmother passed away, she had a beautiful home go going two years ago on Jonah's birthday. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord, but her family was gathered around her, and like she said, do you remember what day that was of the week? It was a Sunday that she went. Well, like on Friday, she was like, guys, I'm going. I'm going to be out of here. I'm not going to make it another day. And then she stuck around uh, for three or four more days. And she would just keep going through lists. 
well, I've talked to Caleb and Missy. She, she couldn't get out of the bed. She was, she was um, stuck in the bed. But she would go, I've talked, I've talked to Lance. And she would think she has a very large family, and she would just count up everybody, and she would go through them over and over. She wanted to make sure that she had talked to everybody that mattered. And she'd go through that list and go through that list. And then she'd call us in, and she'd tell us how much she loved us and how much we meant to her. And it was such a beautiful home going because she just shared and shared, and it was really sweet and precious. And then she got to a point that she said, what's that lady doing? And we're like, Mimi, what lady? She's like, you can't see that lady. She's, she's, she's playing. It looks like she's playing in a big party. She's fixing a table. She's put a tablecloth, and she's setting all this food out. It's, it just looks like she's playing in a great big party. And we were in her little bitty room. And she'd just look over and she could see it. She's like, you can't see that? They know me and we can't see it. She could see it. She was, she was getting ready to go to the other side. And she was already seeing over into the other side. And that is so common. That, is, that happens so many times. And then so uh, we have Lazarus. And it says the angels carried him. Not just one. The angels carried him over. For the believer, crossing over is nothing to fear. Crossing over from this life to the next is nothing to fear. God will have angels escort us. We won't be alone, any part of it. Praise the Lord. So, uh, let's see. A couple of verses on that. Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps all. All those who fear him and delivers them. Another verse that talks about angels. Matthew 18.10 Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Angels are real. Um, okay, so, so we've got the angels taking. Now, this is before Jesus' death, burial, and ascension. We're about to celebrate that with Easter. But before that time, people who died in faith towards God went to a place called paradise, or the, the Luke describes it here as Abraham's bosom. Okay, so uh, it was a place that they could see back and forth between Hades because the rich man could see across the great chasm and he could see Lazarus. And uh, we're going to, in our skit, you're going to see some of that. They're going to be, there's going to be a scene from Abraham's bosom. But the Bible tells us we're not going to go into the details. It would take a while. But uh, that when Jesus uh, resurrected he went and brought them and took them to heaven. Okay, so that, that's not for us. That was uh, for those who died in faith towards Christ before Jesus. They couldn't, uh, his blood had not been paid yet. That price had not been paid yet. Okay, so, so we have that. Um, and then we see that they're both still very much conscious, right? Very much conscious. Uh, Let's see, and we see Jesus uh, reaffirm that in Matthew 10, 28. He said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. The soul outlives the body. Okay? Uh, One way to think about it is, if if you think about the, the laws of physics, the laws of conservation, Do you know your laws of conservation, Uh, that matter cannot be created or destroyed? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. And these are just components on this earth. We can't destroy them. Even with atomic bombs, we know that things can pass from matter to energy, but it's the same amount. God put limits on this earth cannot be created, cannot be constructed. There are limits on what we can do on the matter and the energy on this earth. How much more on a living human being, a living human being, something with the life of God in it, cannot be destroyed. All right, so the Bible talks about several different kinds of death. The first one is uh, that you're familiar with is physical death. Uh, 
Physical death happens to the body because of spiritual death. The reason people die physically is because of the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was spiritual death. Because spiritual death was invited into the world, now we have physical death. The second kind of death is the Bible talks about is eternal death, or it's sometimes called the second death. That means being cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. The second death is being cast to hell, okay, when the Bible talks about that. Okay, but what we're talking about today is being redeemed from spiritual death. Spiritual death is what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve, they didn't die physically, but spiritually. Spiritual death came to the earth first. Sickness, disease, poverty, physical death, any lack, depression, uh, 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 relationship problems are all a result of spiritual death. Uh, in Romans 8, 2, Paul called it the law of sin and death. It is separation from God. The moment that Adam sinned, he was separated from God. Remember in the garden, God said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid myself. That's the effect of sin. Sin separates us. I hid myself, God. Wasn't comfortable with you anymore. So the devil's nature became their nature. And man, it didn't take long to have effect. Adam and Eve's firstborn son murdered their secondborn son. Man had no legal approach to God. His new master is his new nature. Spiritually, man became a child of the devil. All right, let's look at... We see this when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees in John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil... Jesus just tells him, you're of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the Pharisees, he said, you're of the father of your father, the devil. I want you to know what they had. They had good works. They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They prayed. They paid their tithes, and they fasted, but they also lied about Jesus and murdered him. So man cannot be saved by good works. He must be born again. And I want to say this about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man didn't die and go to hell because he was rich. The rich man died and went to hell because his hope was in his riches. Lazarus didn't die and go to, hell because he, um, go to heaven or to paradise because he was poor. He went because he died in faith towards God. All right? So because, because, man, well, let's say this. Before Christ, we're lost, not because of what we do, but because of who we are. Because of who we are. doesn't matter how much money you have, how well-educated you are, how, how much religion you have. You cannot stand in the presence of God with the nature you're born with. Jesus said, you must be born again. Man needs the life of God. Man needs the life of God. I'm going to look, show you several verses here. John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Hebrews 2, 9 says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. Hebrews 9, 26 says, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. John 10, 10, the thief does not come. The Bible has different names for the, for the thief. When you read the book of Revelations, it'll kind of enumerate the different names. It says Satan, the thief, uh, the devil, the great dragon of old, all different names for Satan. The thief does not come except for this purpose, to steal, to kill, and destroy. So when he comes to tempt you, he has an ulterior motive. 
His ulterior motive is to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life. I'm taking them out of darkness, out of death, and into life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Meaning that it's not just a one thing. It's not just a one and done. Abundant life. He not only wants us to have life, he wants us to have life more abundantly. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he, he who hears my word, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. It's not what you do. It's who you are. Shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Jesus came to redeem us from spiritual death. Jesus came to redeem us. So we looked at the very beginning where this all started. Remember when Adam was banished from the garden? Had the big angel, the big cherubim, uh, blocking the way with the, with the uh, sword so that they couldn't find the way to the tree of life because they had rejected God's word? According to Revelation chapter 2, we're brought back to the tree of life. Let's look at that. Re- Revelation 2, 7. Jesus is speaking. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, and he tells us in another place, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb that paid the ransom and the word of our testimony. Jesus, you're my Lord. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So new birth does not take place gradually. It is instantaneous. New birth is instantaneous. You immediately transfer out of one kingdom into a new kingdom. You immediately transfer from darkness into light. From death to life. But now we can grow in our knowledge to have life more abundantly. To have life more abundantly. We don't just get life. We can have life more abundantly. And we do that because when we were in darkness, we have all the ideas of darkness. All the ways of how this world works. All the ways of how our family works. Oh, we know all of our genetic dispositions and problems. And, but as we, as we learn the word of God and we learn uh, what Jesus has redeemed us from, then we grow in revelation and we grow in light and we grow in life abundantly. So the gift of God is new birth. The moment we believe, done. And we saw this last week, Ephesians 2. I want to remind you of Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you he made alive. You he made alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins. That's where we were, in which you once walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Down to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. Come on, faith is, God, I want to do it your way. I want to do it your way. You said whoever believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, Jesus is Lord, shall be born again. I want to do it your way, Lord. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All right, so how do we apply this into our lives? We've got two things. Number one, You must be born again. I just want to encourage you to search your heart. This is not mental assent. This is not, if you feel like, uh, you know, your pastor is between you and God. Well, I listen to them and I believe what they say. 
that might just be mental assent. Mental assent says, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I believe in all that. Yeah, Christian, yeah. But something happens when you believe in your heart. The Word says that your spirit gets born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit, and your heart cries out, Abba, Father. And if you don't know Him as Abba, Father, Abba means Daddy. They weren't allowed. That was one of the things that infuriated the Pharisees is how familiar Jesus was with God. They thought God was so holy that you could not even say his name. And they had written it down and they left the vowels out and we just had the letters. And now we come back and guess at what what the vowels are even supposed to be in there. And people didn't even know how to say it because nobody had heard it said decade after decade after decade, generation after generation. God was holy and distant. And Jesus said, I came to make close. I came to make insiders out of outsiders. I came to make insiders out of outsiders. And Jesus would go and they would say, why do you eat with the sinners? Why do you eat with the tax collectors? Those are the bad guys. Jesus said, it's not, a, it's not the, the well who need a physician. It's the sick. He's saying, you think you're fine. You think you're fine. Jesus came to make insiders out of outsiders. He came to draw us near. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. And I just want to encourage you that it is more than a mental ascent. It is more than mentally going, yeah, okay, sure. I'm fine with that. Number two, how are you going to apply this? The Father God needs you to introduce him to people you know. He needs you to be the introducer. I have a a certain couple. I know this certain young man that I really like, and I know this certain young woman that I really like, and they're both single. And I want to to meet. And I'm working on that. I want them to meet. Meet. So I'm like, I've got this awesome young lady that I just want you to meet. And I tell her, I've got this awesome young man I want you to meet. So we were working on that. See, I'm introducing them to each other. Well, see, there needs to be uh, introductions happening in your life. God needs you to be the one that introduces him. That says, you know, when people, it comes up. People are afraid of death. And they'll even say things like, um, Oh, we don't we don't want to do that. We don't want to die and go to hell. Well, it's not what you do. It's who you are. And when you know that and you hear somebody say that, you can say, I'm not afraid of dying and going to hell. I'm not going to hell. You don't have to be afraid of going to hell. And you can share the good news. You can share the gospel. The price has been paid. That is the good news. The price was paid for the whole world. It's a blank check. It's a blank check. But the Father needs you to tell that to some people that are got their thinking wrong. They've been going to church their whole life, maybe. Maybe they've never been to church. Maybe they've been turned off by church. Maybe they've been turned off by Christians. He needs you to step in and say, there's a really good news here. You don't want to miss out on this. You don't want to miss out on these benefits. Participate with him in making insiders out of outsiders. Can you find some people on the outside and bring them to the inside? It's a really fun adventure. It's a really fun adventure. Nothing else in life compares to making insiders out of outsiders. And if you will open your heart to that, God will start showing you. It can be strangers. It can be people you know. But I'm telling you where you can start. The next time you hear somebody mention something about being afraid of death, you can be like, afraid of death? Why would I be afraid of death? Angels are going to come escort me. I don't know if your angels stay with you constantly, but I know they're there whenever you need them. 
You are never without the assistance you need. But I know that when you cross over, they take you to the other side. That's good news to people afraid of dying. Let's stand to our feet. You know, Easter is a really good time to bring somebody to church with you. It's the service made for that. Praise you, Lord. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Savior of the world. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. Thank you for spilling your blood to pay my ransom price that angels are escorting me into your presence when I leave this body. Thank you that I get to partake in your paradise of the tree of life and live eternally with you as you intended it to be all along. Thank you, Father God, for the price that Jesus paid. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for the things I don't have to suffer, that I don't have to fear, that I don't have to experience because I've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that my spirit's been made new. I have been born again. Thank you that my spirit cries, Abba, Daddy, I get to draw near to you. And you are a daddy to me. A daddy that I find favor with. A daddy who has nothing but good gifts for me. I worship you. I praise you, Lord. And Lord, I want to live my life close to you. I want to live my life in fellowship with you. I don't want anything to come between me and you. Lord, I want to live in faith that we are walking this walk together. And that means I've got to be available to you. Available to share my testimony. Lord, this goodness you've given me isn't for me to hoard up and hide and, and put under a bushel. But this goodness is so that I can let my light shine before men and they will know my good works and know my Father. And I thank you, Father God. I thank you for giving every person here increased revelation and light into their redemption. Father God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring it to their remembrance and that they'll meditate on these things. They'll meditate on these things and they'll think, what does this mean? Am I ready to share this? Do I understand this now? Now what's first and what's second and what's third? What is my redemption? What does it mean to me? And Lord, I pray that you give each one of us a heart uh, after your heart. Your heart is for the precious fruit of the earth. Your heart is to go find the outsiders and to bring them in. And Father God, that we would develop a heart. That you'd give us the words to say. We'll say it the way we talk. We'll be us. We'll share for real what you've done. For real. Because you are real. And you do work in our lives. And we'll be more sensitive to your leading. We just commit ourselves this morning. We consecrate. We consecrate. Father, we'll go where you tell us to go. We'll do what you tell us to do. We'll say what you tell us to say. And we'll walk in communion with you. And you'll back us up. The power of God will be present every time. Every time. Hallelujah. If there's anybody that wants prayer, you know, we've been set free. 
We've been set free. If you want prayer this morning, if you've got sickness, if you've got a problem, and you're like, I need my brothers and sisters to join faith with me, I'm just going to ask you to come down this morning. To come down. We do it different ways, different times. But just come on down, and we're going to join faith together. We don't have to share this thing out loud, but we can join our faith together. The power of God's present to heal. The power of God's present to deliver. The power of God is present to set free. That thing that you're saying, man, I wish I could be free of that. Well, you can. Oh, we praise you. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you. Can we worship? Hallelujah. We magnify you, God. Let's just worship him. And if you want to respond to that, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you recognize, you know what, I'm concerned that it has just been a mental ascent. Come on down and let's fix it this morning. Your name is life. Oh, we worship you, God. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Your name is power. Oh, and your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just commit. Just take a moment. Consecrate. That's something we have to do again and again. Consecrate yourself to his plan. Just tell him. Pray it out loud. Dear Lord, I commit myself to you. I walk with you. I follow you. I listen to you. And I obey. We're going places together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for every person here. Lord, I thank you. They're precious in your sight. I thank you, those that aren't here. Father God, those watching online. I thank you, Father God, that you're speaking and working and moving. The Word is working mightily at True North Church. It's working mightily in every family. It's working mightily in every individual because the Word is mighty to save mighty to deliver, mighty to set free. Father God, I thank you. We're going where we haven't been. Lord, I thank you. You're taking us there. Father God, I thank you for your protection and safety this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Your name is power. Your name